where they're stuck in this position of we have to pay versus, you know, we're not supposed to pay according to most government regulations because yeah. this money is usually going to countries that we're not supposed to send money to. I've had a customer basically tell me we will have to pay the ransom because we can't put a value on human life. It is predicted that cybercrime will cost the global economy over $9.2 trillion in 2024, according to the data research company Statista. Their research shows the number of firms targeted by ransomware attacks has increased by almost 20% in the last five years, with 72% of organizations being hit in 2023. You'll often hear about what we do to protect ourselves, training people to spot attacks, using two-factor authentication to protect our login details, and using AI tools to identify threats. But that's an individual or organizational level approach. What are we doing to tackle cybercrime on a global scale? The good news is we're doing quite a lot. And that's what we'll be exploring in this episode. You're listening to Technology Untangled, a show which looks at the rapid evolution of technology and unravels the way it's changing our world. We're your hosts, Michael Bird and Aubrey Lovell. Twenty twenty four will mark the twentieth anniversary of the Budapest Convention coming into effect. Brought about by the Council of Europe, it was the first international treaty to address computer crime by bringing together national laws and looking to increase cooperation between nations. To date, 69 countries have signed the convention agreement and many have based their own cybercrime laws around it. That's a great start. But cybercrime is still a huge industry. In fact, one major bank recently announced at the World Economic Forum that they were thwarting billions of attacks every single day at a cost of over $15 billion in security investment each year. We've linked to that in the show notes, but they aren't the only ones facing an onslaught. My name is Deepak Verma. I'm head of product for uh, HP's data protection. Most of our customers are facing cyber incidents. They've become a lot more prevalent. Coming from an industry where we're used to protecting customers from uh, natural disasters or even human uh, error type disasters. It was just a shocking twist in the cause of disaster. So Gosh. that's been a, a big change in what we're seeing from our customers. The industries that are being affected are the ones that you would think are not very common, right? We think of our financial data, we mm. think of our banks being hit, we bring our money being extorted. But what I've seen a bigger ramp up on is industries where data can't be changed. So for example, healthcare industry, because your healthcare information can't be changed. It's a lot easier for you to change mm -hmm. your credit card information. It's impossible for you to change your health history. So when that data is held hostage, that starts becoming a challenge. Same thing with education being the, the second most hit. These industries typically don't have the money that they can throw at prevention, intrusion, detection, red team exercises. So a lot of times they're easy targets for the bad actors. Education is a surprising target, but Deepak's right. In fact, according to one report we've linked to in the show notes, in 2022, 79% of higher educational organizations that were surveyed said they were hit. It's clear that cybercrime is a massive issue across many, many sectors. So it's no surprise that there's an increasing feeling among organizations and many governments that something needs to be done on a global scale. But what? One place where that's being debated is the World Economic Forum, which brings together public and private bodies for greater global cooperation. My name is Joanna Bucart, and I am a lead at the Center for Cybersecurity of the World Economic Forum. The Center for Cybersecurity at the World Economic Forum was set up in 2018, and that was upon the recognition that cyber was a topic that needed to be addressed in itself, for itself, and if you want, our main mission is to elevate cybersecurity as a strategic imperative. We've seen in our research, and especially at our Global Cybersecurity Outlook Report, which is the report we'll release every year during our annual meeting in Davos, 
that there has been an increasing awareness across executives and boards on the importance of cybersecurity. So this is a risk that's most probably increasing. There has been an increasing awareness across private sector organizations, as I mentioned, also across public sector organizations. We're seeing more and more national cybersecurity agencies being set up, for example. And that testifies of the fact it's taking more importance on the global scene. Talking of cybersecurity agencies, it's all well and good organizations and governments coming together to discuss cybercrime and defend against it. But someone has to actually stop the attacks at source and go after the criminals. After all, attack is the best form of defense. But how do you do that when an organization in, for example, the U.S. is under attack by, say, a gang of cyber criminals in Nigeria? That's where Craig Jones comes in. My name's Craig Jones. I'm a seconded law enforcement official in the United Kingdom. And I've been seconded into Interpol, which is the international policing organization. And my role specifically as the director of cybercrime is to lead our global cybercrime program, which looks to reduce the harm of cybercrime globally. We would have four clear objectives within that program. So understanding the threat picture, um, carrying out operations with member countries, helping build capability capacity of countries, and then also what is Interpol's role in that global security architecture. When a country comes to us that needs our support, we look at what sort of support they need. In 2020 or 21, there was an attack on the colonial pipeline in the US. Not long after that, there was an attack on the Irish healthcare service, and it took down the Irish healthcare service for a number of weeks. So all of a sudden, you had a number of countries coming together that had been attacked by ransomware. And there was then a joint initiative launched in the US called the Counter Ransomware Initiative. So this is looking at different policies. You know, what, what works best? How do we share this information? Then we have another pillar which looks at capacity building and diplomacy within cybercrime as well and ransomware. And the final one was the International Counter Ransomware Task Force. Um, that's led by Australia. That now has about 50 plus countries as part of that. And Interpol, we're part of that as well. So we're able to dock into all our 196 countries who are not all members of the Counter Ransomware Initiative. So that's coming together globally in cooperation. So that, that's one example that we look at. But what we've built out now in terms of supporting our operational activity, and I'll give you an example of this, is in Africa. So two and a half years ago, we set up the uh, Africa Regional Cybercrime Operations Desk. So we now have officers based directly in our four regional bureaus in Africa, and they work directly with the countries, the regional part, so the Africa Union, Afropol, and then the sub-regions as well, and also the national um, cybercrime units. We provide data sets into them. So that's one form of operational activity. Another form would be identification of an organized crime group, such as we did in Nigeria back in 2022 and 2023. Police came to us and said, look, we know we've got a problem. We need some assistance. We brought in some of our private sector cybercrime uh, security companies who see who those threat actors are. We then aggregate that data set with Nigeria's data set. We then look globally where those individuals are organized crime group being harming. And then we bring an operation together. And Nigeria were very clear. They wanted to prosecute in their own country. So we were able to do this in Nigeria. And that, that model worked really well because that showed, you know, Nigeria were taking the problem of cybercrime emanating from their country very, very seriously. But actually, because of the funders and donors that we have to our projects, we were able to say, look, Interpol is able to implement a program or an activity here which reduces harm from cybercrime in your country effectively. It's fascinating that Interpol are able to act as both mentors and enablers to stamp out cybercrime. And it's not surprising that the field is increasingly becoming an international focus because it's not just data or money that's at risk. There's real risk to lives as well. Stealing or damaging commercial data is one thing, and the potential value of the damage can be huge. But when it comes to attacks which have tangible real-world impacts, it's a whole different ballgame. And something which, according to Joanna, the world is starting to take very, very seriously. When we're looking at, again, this 
digitalization, this interconnectivity. We're taking especially an angle looking at critical infrastructure, and you mentioned healthcare services. At the forum, we work also with the electricity industry, but we've been running a cyber resilience in electricity initiative over four years now, looking at cyber resilience in the electricity sector, at manufacturing, at oil and gas, and there is this aspect that now an incident on one part of a critical infrastructure can have ripple effect into other critical infrastructure, looking at electricity that provides energy for a lot of different parts of other critical infrastructure, like, like the healthcare sector. It's really key to ensure the resilience of those sectors in particular. And this initiative, it developed guidelines, it developed reports, position papers, and it was so well established that the European Commission requested the community to provide a commentary on the NIS2 directive. So for, uh, for context, the NIS2 directive is the latest EU-wide cybersecurity regulation. That's harrowing to hear. We take it for granted that our physical infrastructure is safe, but I guess when you think about it, it's not so far-fetched that hackers could take down electrical infrastructure. In fact, it's already happened all the way back in 2010. Stuxnet was a malicious computer worm initially designed by officially unknown parties to, it's believed, target Iran's nuclear power program. What's interesting, though, and where the power of international cooperation really comes into its own was that through the World Economic Forum, member organizations were able to feed back on the European NIS2 directive, allowing the private sector to have a positive impact in looking at legislation and providing insight. Here's Joanna. So the community then developed a position paper and it provides feedback on the directive to the regulator. That is significant because one of the key issues that we hear across our partner organizations is that regulations are very top-down and they are very limited opportunities for the private sector to provide inputs on packages as they are being designed. Of course, being prepared is a huge part of combating these attacks. You can have disaster recovery tools and you can have stress-tested your organization to ensure it can withstand a barrage and still function and innovate. But that doesn't mean you're totally invulnerable. And in fact, many people aren't that well prepared at all. It's one of the big operational areas where Interpol steps in. Not necessarily in just solving crime, but preventing it with global awareness campaigns. Because even today, most people don't know how serious the threat is or how preventable becoming a victim is. Let's look at crime in a physical sense. So sitting here in Singapore, they invest very heavily in their police service, they invest in that physical security, CCTV cameras, laws, legislation. When we transfer that into the online space, we're working in a totally different environment. The internet inherently is an open system. Quite often, cybersecurity is not hard baked into those solutions. And as consumers, quite often, we want to be able to get online easily. We don't want to be bothering with two-factor authentication. We don't want to be looking at VPNs. So in terms of how we solve this, for me, I've tried to break it down in terms of our programming, prevention, detection, investigation, disruption. So in that prevention piece, you know, we can probably prevent about 80% of cybercrime. There's some simple things that criminals will take advantage of time and time again. And they can do this in a volume way and they can do this in an automated way as well. Some of the high-end cyber attacks or cyber crimes that we see, yeah, they're going to be really hard to defend against. And that's why, certainly on the business side, we have to understand now there is a cost to doing business online. And that cost does come in the form of some form of cyber security. And I, I sometimes look and it, it's about cyber safety. It's how do we make individuals safer? How do we make organizations safer? The buy-in to cybersecurity is clearly gathering pace. Spending in the sector is estimated to reach more than $183 billion in 2024, according to research specialist Statista. We've linked that report in the show notes. Deepak Varma says he understands why that level of investment is needed to protect individuals and organizations. 
I've had a customer basically tell me we will have to pay the ransom because we can't put a value on human life. And then the healthcare organizations, to get that data back, they will have to pay the ransom. So we're stuck in this position of we have to pay versus, you know, we're not supposed to pay according to most government regulations because yeah. this money is usually going to countries that we're not supposed to send money to. It is a global issue, the bad actors don't look at geographic borders. They don't look at demographics. They don't look at any of the geopolitical borders. They look at IP addresses that are available on the internet and anything that can be hit, anything that they can get access to, regardless of where the company is located. The other uh, interesting change I've seen is there are ransomware as a service platforms available where if you're a bad actor and all you have is access, you've figured out some backdoor into an organization, but you don't have the skills, the knowledge, the tool set, you can actually get ransomware as a service where they will split the cost of the <laughs> ransom with you by providing their services. So all you have to do is find a backdoor in. So the barrier of entry is quite low, but the exactly. potential impact is really high. Exactly. We try to be both reactive and proactive from the lessons that we learned. So learning from some of our customers that have been hit and helping them recover, the lessons we learned, the patterns that we start seeing, we want to deploy them into the uh, solutions that we can provide the customers. And being an HP, we have such a large portfolio of products from the AI technologies to you know security built in every layer from network, storage, etc that we've been more focused recently, so for example, with the Zerto Cyber Resilience Vault that takes advantage of all of the technologies or a majority of the technologies that HP already provides, combines them into a solution and gives that to a customer to give them a better chance to recover and prevent some of these attacks. So organizations like HPE are starting with the individual, spotting patterns and scaling that up to regional and global threat analysis. But what next? Well, this is where the cooperative side of things appears again, because thanks to the reach of organizations like Interpol, that data can have a massive positive effect across the board. Here's Craig. Interpol has a number of sort of database and technology, and we connect into 196 countries. So countries can share data sets with us. We then aggregate data sets, and then we can share those data sets with other countries. We can also bring data sets in from private partners. So as Interpol, we, we have a piece called the Gateway Initiative. And this allows us to work with a number of private sector companies in that cybersecurity field who have really good insights into global crime threat. So we're able to bring data sets in from them. They're able to highlight to those to us. And what we do is support and coordinate. So coming back to those activities in Africa, we identified compromised infrastructure and internet service providers. We then have secure tools and platforms that those countries come on to, so we share the information on there. Then they're able to go into an internet service provider in a country, they're able to say, right, this infrastructure is actually contributing to crime and the activities actually break laws in your country. So you need to take that down. But we're able to identify those high harm threats that are impacting and bring those data sets in. So the member countries can communicate themselves, they can make requests to each other, and this is all to sort of further law enforcement collaboration and cooperation. They can then share data and information with Interpol. So we have a, a rules-based organisation, so we can only deal anything that is crime. So our Article 3 precludes us from dealing anything that's military religious, um, racist or political. And that's really important. And actually, that underpins a core principle of Interpol and helps us remain neutral. But also we have people as well. So that's one of our strongest areas is being able to come directly into a country. So I can step outside my office and I've got my uh, assistant director from operations from USA. My assistant director for cyber strategy and capability development is from China. My assistant director um, for cyber threat response is just about to join us actually from South Korea. Um, I have my head of Intel from Brazil. I have uh, a member of um, the Iranian cybercrime police with us as well. So these are all law enforcement officials. I can go directly out to them. And whilst we all work for Interpol, we're international civil servants, I know who to compact back in the UK. So I can then reach back into the UK. So that's one of our real, real strengths. 
So information from private enterprise, government agencies, and big data analytics are helping Interpol filter the international politics out and tackle the criminals on the ground through a combination of technology and human interaction. And it's two-way traffic. Private enterprise is able to use the combined expertise and guidance of internationally collaborative bodies to protect their own data and customers, as Deepak explains. Following a lot of the standards that are set. So for example, in the United States, we have NIST, the Cybersecurity Framework 2.0 that has come out that talks about a comprehensive solution. The same thing applies in the EU. There's a, a EU agency that focuses on specifically on cybersecurity. So they'll set out a lot of the regulations and a lot of the standards and best practices for organizations. They'll also post information out there on latest hits and patterns, etc. So not only are we using some of those best practices to help customers stay in compliance for the regulators, for their internal auditors, but we're also using that as a framework to develop our technology so that we can help them meet that. Because it's a double-edged sword these days, right? Not only are the customers concerned about preventing that data loss and then obviously recovery in that scenario, but they also yeah. want to be compliant. They don't want to be caught off guard, not having the right solution in, in place. It appears we're back to NIST 2 again, which is great because it shows just how well the global system of cooperation is working. Organizations are feeding back to legislators and legislators are keeping them in the loop, both on best practice and identified security weaknesses. According to their own sources, which we've linked in the show notes, the HPE Security Center logs 2.6 billion events every day. So it's reassuring to know governments and organizations are coming together to collaborate. But how strong is the willingness to come together amongst members of the private sector? Here's Joanna. You know, the public sector has the ability to be a harmonizing force and to set the tone, really. It has the mandate, really the legislative mandate to prosecute, uh, to set up regulations. Whereas the private sector, they have the... um, You know, they are quite advanced in terms of technical capabilities and also on innovation. They are pretty good at anticipating what's on the horizon. Cybersecurity is still quite a firefighting field and it could benefit from being more more strategic focused in that sense. And this this is why we're still working towards bridging that gap (laughs) between the cyber leaders and the execs and boards and that understanding. Now, on top of that awareness, we also um, have our global cybersecurity outlook report, as I mentioned, that we release in Davos. And it's, it's actually among our most downloaded reports. And it's been used in some organizations by cyber leaders to really make the case for cybersecurity to, to our leadership and to have the understanding on both sides for that cyber leaders understand the business requirements and priorities and that execs and boards understand the steps they need to take to make sure their organizations can deliver the value over time. Now the challenge obviously is that these groups don't always work in unison and it would be good to allow more collaboration and break the silos around that. So is that happening? Well... Maybe. Certainly, there's an appetite for more collaboration, or at least a realization that different security vendors can benefit each other whilst also still competing in some aspects. Deepak, for example, recognizes that everyone bringing something different to the table can really advance the fight against the criminals. We've got a few uh, uh, partners that we've partnered with that on certain fronts we will compete with, but on other fronts, we will cooperate with, especially the security vendors, right? Sure, yeah. So at first blush, it will appear as though we're providing the same service as a lot of security vendors. But when we dig layers deeper, you find that what we've found is specific partnerships in the security space specifically will provide a value that we don't provide. So this is where integration of solutions together to bring a better end-to-end portfolio to the customer starts providing value. Joanna's experience at the World Economic Forum backs that up. She's seen firsthand that there is a willingness between organizations, even competitors, to really crack cybercrime collaboratively, even if that is difficult to orchestrate at times. And while, as she said a few minutes ago, there needs to be a more strategic cooperation on a daily basis, 
Actually, when everyone works together, it does bear fruit. There's an appetite for collaboration to tackle cybercrime. Just within the nonprofit sector, there are some alliances that bring various private organizations together, and it's been operating successfully for several years now. The public sector is also increasingly open to collaborations with the private sector. We've got Europol and Interpol that have various forms of partnership. And, well, an example I, I like is the Operation Nervone, led by Interpol earlier this year. So here there was a collaboration between Interpol and private sector organizations, and it allowed to take down some senior members of from a cyber criminal group in West Africa. And the group was believed to have stolen between 11 and 30 million US dollars over four years. So I think that was really interesting. There is the private-public cooperation and the regional or even like global cooperation that needs to happen. So many, many different stakeholders. At the forum, currently, we are starting an initiative to tackle this and to bring those different stakeholders together. The Cybercrime Atlas tackles this. It really wants to foster collaboration to counter those cyber criminals. And it's a bit of a proof of concept that has, it has the support now, I think it's 20 uh, private sector organizations and NGOs and public sector partners. And it shows that pooling OSINT, so open source intelligence, is an effective way of creating that shared knowledge based on threat, threat actors. And that can help support collaboration to counter them on a global scale. So we're at a stage where global organizations, public, private, and NGO, are working together to tackle cybercrime. We're seeing legislation and guidelines slowly being put together to level the playing field and give everyone access to the same information in order to maximize our cybersecurity. We're seeing information being shared up and down the chain to allow governments to block harmful actors or arrest criminals on the ground. We're seeing that data being fed back from governments and police forces to our security providers. It's a great, virtuous cycle. But it's not the end of the road, because in order to truly understand and have a chance of fighting cybercrime, you've really got to have a standardization and global agreement. There has to be legislation or best practice that everyone agrees to follow to make sure that wherever it comes from, cybercrime can be fought. So is that likely? Well, maybe, but not yet. At least not in the private sector. Here's Deepak. Are we approaching a level of standardization? Not yet. So you're going to find a lot of companies saying they offer some level of detection that uses AI ML technologies. How they approach this is completely different. You're going to find technologies that may do post scanning and how effectively they can determine what ransomware is living in there and yeah. then act upon it. And you know, my advice to customers would be you got to look at the whole spectrum. And then you have to look at vendors that are bringing you layers of security, layers of detection, yeah. layers of prevention layers of recoverability across your entire portfolio. And unfortunately, you know, HPE, with how broadly we play across products, we've been able to provide a majority of that. And then with the partnerships that we have, uh, we're able to fill a lot no. of the gaps. But that's, but that's where, in order to be able to fight ransomware more effectively, some standardization across the industry is probably needed to some yeah, degree. There's definitely, like the standards exist that will talk about what a framework would be, sure. but nothing deeper from a technology standpoint. And it, and it is, fairly new for a lot of organizations. Mm. But what about legislation on an international level? Well, you won't be surprised to know that it's a slow process. But the COGS are in motion at the highest global levels to come together on cybercrime. And Craig Jones is right in the middle of it. So when we talk about a cybercrime convention, some countries, no, 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 we're not doing a cybercrime convention. And the reason we're not doing it is because we don't have a general consensus of cybercrime at the moment. However, a resolution was adopted and effectively the ad hoc committee to elaborate on an international convention to counter the use of information and communications technology for criminal purposes was born. Now that's quite a mouthful. And I may not have got every word right, but this is where it's really important that we do get the words right. So the process that we've been going through for the last two and a half years, there's been meetings over two weeks at a time in both Vienna and New York, and they're two weeks each time. And that is to 
come up with this international convention. Using language which has been adopted at the United Nations and it's neutral language effectively. So there's things in there about, you know, what does criminalization look like? What does international cooperation look like? And there's a whole different number of articles in there which they will then be discussing. And then once there's a general agreement, they will go back to the General Assembly of the United Nations to get it agreed. And then it will go to each country to sign off. If there's not, it will go to a vote. So some of these processes in the United Nations take many, many years. I've been at every single session. And trust me, when you're going through three sessions a day, sometimes from 10 o'clock till one o'clock, three o'clock till six o'clock, seven o'clock till 10 o'clock at night, it may seem, oh, okay, we just listen to people talk. But I've seen this as one of the quickest processes that I have observed at the United Nations, not having been involved previously. I have been confident all the way through we will have something. Best case scenario would be in 2024. Will we have it? I think the jury is out on that, but I think we need leaders and countries to recognise, look, we can't deal with this just in one country. We've got to build in that international part to it. When we look at countries taking strong leadership in that space by saying, no, this is not acceptable. No, we do not want our communities harmed by cyber criminals. There's got to be buy-in to that. We couldn't agree more. And hopefully, it'll come to pass. You've been listening to Technology Untangled. We've been your hosts, Michael Bird and myself, Aubrey Lovell. And huge thanks to Deepak Varma, Joanna Buchart, and Craig Jones. You can find more information on today's episode in the show notes. This is the last in the current series of Technology Untangled, but do subscribe on your podcast app of choice so you don't miss out. And check out the last four series. And in the meantime, don't forget to check out our sister podcast, Technology Now, for a weekly hit of Aubrey, myself, and the technology news and stories that you should know about. This episode was produced by Sam Datapolin and Al Booth with production support from Zoe Anderson, Harry Morton, Alicia Kempson, Alison Paisley, Alyssa Mitri, Camilla Patel, Alex Podmore, and Chloe Sewell. Our lovely social editorial team is Rebecca Wissinger, Judy Ann Goldman, Katie Guarino, and our social media designers are Alejandra Garcia, Carlos Alberto Suarez, and Ambar Maldonado. Technology Untangled is a Lower Street production for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Thank you.